My name is Matthew Bronson, and I'm an Associate Professor and Director of Academic Assessment at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where um, I'm trained as a linguist, and I've been looking at the areas of language and consciousness and Native American and indigenous worldview for uh, some 25 years or so. And I met Dan Moonhawk Alford in 1982 at the University of California Berkeley Linguistics Department and went to this class of his that was taught at UC Extension in San Francisco and instantly just felt that kind of special chemistry that happens, I think, occasionally, if you're lucky, you know, at least once in your life, of a soulmate, heartfelt collaboration. He introduced me to the Native American worldview, Native American languages, and especially the work of Benjamin Lee Worf, who was circulated like a sort of a taboo pamphlet that you didn't want to be caught with. And it instantly made sense to me because I had actually gotten into linguistics because I was fascinated by the idea that the language that we speak has a lot to do with the way that we experience reality. But it goes unquestioned because language is the medium that we move in. So Dan and I, that began a, a collaboration that lasted 20 years, and he invited me to come and teach a course for him. And then in 1992, Dan was part of the Fetzer Dialogues, which, that was really Leroy Little Bear and David Peet getting together over at Harvard. And David Peet had lamented that you really couldn't express the essence of quantum physics in English. But, and, and Leroy Little Bear was, in looking into it, realized that a lot of the problems conceptually that were presented by trying to talk about these things in English were much more amenable in Blackfoot. And so then in 1998, Dan had the idea to um, pick up on that thread of discussion. Because during those discussions, they came up with some really powerful insights, and it was important in a number of ways. I think, first of all, because it would be the first time in 500 years that I know of, that we know of, where scientists and native elders were in dialogue as equals. That's dramatic. That's, that's life-changing. I mean, that, that's a, an earthquake in the, in the context of this post-colonial moment. And this is really it was really quite different because this was a, a dialogue launched in a spirit of respect where the scientists were the ones that are in pain essentially because their maps have uh, run out. You know, it's like in those old medieval times when you see the known world and then everywhere else it says, here be monsters. You know, it's like you're off the map. Um, that's the, the moment in 21st century science, I think, that well, late 20th century, 21st century science that this dialogue was launched in was um, the understanding that the representation systems of just talking about subject, verb, object, and the way that English segmented the world wasn't going to get us to the next step of really being able to visualize and conceptualize these invisible realms of reality. And so that was the promise. And so from those initial dialogues, they came up with some interesting cross-cultural equations. For example, or some principles that they could all agree on. One was that um, everything vibrates. Everything is vibration. Everything is energy. The indigenous scientists and the, and the Western scientists were in absolute agreement on that point. And they came up with an interesting cross-cultural equation that what Native America has called the realm of spirit, what linguists call meaning, and what quantum physicists call the quantum realm, may very well be the same thing with notational variations. It's a notational variant, but they're all pointing towards a realm of interpenetrating simultaneous connections that undergird the everyday reality. And that was a pretty exciting proposition. So out of these initial dialogues, some 
there was a kind of a consensus and then there was a tremendous energy that was generated but there wasn't funding to continue so Dan came up with a model whereby we could launch the dialogue here in Albuquerque. So I came as one of the participants as Moonhawk's teaching partner and was brought into a kind of transformative feel. It must be what people used to feel back in the days when you had a really good powwow. The sense of community, the sense of connection, and excitement, and the level of sharing and love between these people who have been divided for so long. It touched me in my heart because I think this is a wound that all of us carry, and white people have our own special burden in this, that um, I think, for me, what it got me over on a personal level was the exoticization. That is, the whole Pocahontas syndrome, that Native American indigenous people are this in this pure, pristine state, and that they had it all, and we lost it. And I think I still had a lot of that, those stereotypes that we have until first contact, that was a deep healing for me personally to um, feel that I was helping to do something to to move the conversation along from where it's been stuck for all these hundreds of years. The whole worlds would be born and die, you know, in the space between each of the sharings and it becomes a, a kind of deep empathetic connection because most of the time you're sitting there silent in these dialogues, which is so different from most of the testosterone driven look at how wonderful I am kind of approach to academic conferences. At this juncture, that's powerful medicine. So it's an opening, and it's an opening in which everyone is welcome. There's a way in which we can say that we're all indigenous people. So I think the opportunity is for us to lift each other up and to work on this, the head magic as well as the heart magic. And these, these conferences and these dialogues are, are, are exploring that just in the, in the format and the freewheeling nature of, of how it happens and um, the people that, that come together. So I feel like uh, I don't want to make too much of it because we're just a bunch of people sitting around in a room in Albuquerque, really. But by the same token, um, that's how worlds are remade. It's exactly in rooms with people working it out that we forge some, um, some solutions, some responses, capacities, take it back out in the world, come back next year. I bought a house in Sonoma County in 1988 and I found myself over the last 20 years becoming indigenous to that place. It's like being on a first name basis with nature. There, there are these beautiful little golden finches that I feed and I've gotten to know them individually and there are these hummingbirds, there's one who's, I call him pushy, you know, because he like tries to push all the other hummingbirds away and you start to see the intricate dynamics. I just find that so nurturing and so connecting and so that's just become a really important part of my life. I can't imagine not um, being in that kind of relationship. And it takes a commitment to cut through it all because we're such an, uh, a rootless people. And I'm a fifth generation Californian, but I don't think that my people ever, ever much had much of the luxury of feeling like that they were part of this place because so much of it was just they were dirt farmers and so forth and it was just a struggle for survival. So it's like in, by the luck of being in this generation, I have a chance to to reconnect. I ended up in a more intimate connection with nature and then also having a capacity to really collaborate and have genuine partnership with people. It allows me to connect with the larger we that's underneath the me and um, that's the wind beneath my wings right now I think.